Help! 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 Molly, Help me! Jesus, yep. they believe that God 
individually. Wow, man, he must be busy. He must be. Wow. But that ties in with what the dude says what? about creation and about how we're all unique. Am I unique? Yeah. Oh. You're a pain in the neck. <laughs> no, that's nice. That's nice. Yes, you are. We are brothers and sisters. All oh. unique. Even though we might look a bit alike, even twins. Twins can look very alike, but they are unique. Do we you? are all unique and different. Well, I remember that the dude told us one thing that we are all fearfully and wonderfully made and that we are really special to God. Yes. But I don't know what. I don't know what fearfully and wonderfully means. Does that just mean that we're unique, we're special? I think so. That's what our teacher was saying as part of our RME lesson too. Ah. Because we've been looking at what Christians believe. Ah. So, sounds all good. Well, I know, I know that in the Bible it also says that Jesus knew us before we were even born. That's how precious we are to him. Oh, that is so cool. Is that cool? It is cool. So he likes you. <laughs> What's not to like? <laughs> Guess what? What? He likes me too. <laughs> oh, and he even likes Molly. Yes, even although we can't see him. Oh, poor Molly. Yeah. I hope he's back next week. I'm sure. Hope so. That's great. That, that God and everything. Quite cool, I think. Yeah. You fancy going and playing snowball fights? Okay. Me okay. first. Me first. Oh, okay. Me, 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 me. Okay. Let's go. Let's okay, go. Let's See go. ya. Bye. Bye. Well, good morning. Welcome to Pergordon Community Church again. It's great to have you with us. And just actually going on from what um, Jack and Jill were speaking about, it made me really think about the uniqueness of each and every one of us. Um, as we know and as we've heard that each snowflake that falls is completely different. And that just astounds us in one sense. And really, when we think about that, each and every one of us that's listening to this broadcast and others, each and every one of us is different, not to the same. And that is an amazing thing to think about in itself. And Jesus loves you for who you are. God loves us for who we are. 
We all have different traits and habits and good points. He loves us for who we are. And that's something to cherish. That's something really to grasp onto. Um, and when we think about our own children and how different our own children actually are or our nieces and nephews are, and we love them for each, for the difference, for the uniqueness that they are, that's a way that God looks on us. He loves you for you. Isn't that amazing? I just think that is mind-blowing. But before we continue and before we go on to our next series in the What If series, then let's just come before God. Let's, let's pray. Father, we come before you again. And Lord, we just thank you that you love us for who we are. Lord, we don't need to try to be something different. We don't need to try to be someone different. Father, we don't need to put a charade on because, Father, you know us. You knew us before we were even formed in our mother's womb. Father, you've got a plan for our lives. Father, you love us, every single one of us, for who we really are. You care for us. Father, you have compassion on us. Lord, you rejoice when we rejoice. You, Father, you are sorrowful when we are hurting. Father, we just pray that as we go through this service today, the rest of this service today, Lord, we just pray that your spirit would minister to us. Lord, we just feel as we're praying that there is folks who are just needing that we boost. Father, those who are needing that we uplift. And Lord, as we come to worship this morning, we pray that you would lift them. Father, that you would help them in their hour of need, that you would draw alongside them in their hour of need. Father, you know each and every one of us. You know what we need at this particular time. And Father, we thank you for that. We thank you that you can minister into our lives. You can send your spirit into our lives. And as we meet together in many, many different locations, we thank you that you are omnipresent. Father, you are everywhere at once. As you are here with us this morning, you are there with people who are listening. Lord, let them feel that overwhelming love we ask. Father, let them feel that overwhelming, that overwhelming care that you have for them. Father, let them rejoice in that. Father, sing a new song, we ask. And Lord, we pray that as we go through this service, Father, that you would continue to inspire us Father, that you would continue to renew us and refresh us. And it is through the power of your Holy Spirit that you do this. So Lord, as we continue, we just thank you for your presence. And again, we just thank you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Looking at this subject this morning, what if Christ didn't die? then we run the risk of actually opening a Pandora's box. And really, what we would be saying is that the Bible is false, that God isn't true, that the, the resurrection never happened. And this is a fundamental truth 
of the Christian faith, along with other truths that we believe in. So really, we're putting a huge question mark if we don't believe that Christ actually died. And in the passage that we're going to read at, we could have picked up on this because there is so many questions within this, <coughs> excuse me, within this passage itself. Um, and we could have just looked at each and every one of these questions. But I would like to look at a statement or take this from this subject from a statement that is said in these verses. So we'll read from Matthew chapter 11, eh, Matthew chapter 27, sorry, and we'll read from verses 11 to 18. Going to run out of battery. So Matthew, <coughs> so Matthew chapter 27, verses 11 to 18. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time they had a well-known prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd gathered, Pilate asked them, which one? Do you want me to release to you? Is it Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. When Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, he was sent a message. And this is what we're going to look at this morning. And the message read, Don't have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. And of course, it was Pilate's wife that sent that message to him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of these two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why, what crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. All the people answered, his blood is on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. As I said, there was a message from Pilate's wife, and this is what we're going to look at. 
don't have anything to do with that innocent man or that righteous man, for I have suffered a great deal because of him in a dream. But before we come to that, one thing that just kind of um, jumped out at me, as it were, when we're reading that this, this morning here, is just that wee statement, it's your responsibility. That in itself is a massive, massive statement. I wonder if anyone has asked you, what do you think of Jesus? What do you do with Jesus? Have you done anything with Jesus? You know, it's our responsibility how we react to that. We can accept him as our Lord and Saviour. Or like the crowd in this story, we can reject him. I wonder where you stand. Is it a case that you've accepted Jesus? Or is it a case that you have actually rejected him? The first thing that we would know, need to we need to realize if we say that Jesus didn't die, then there would be no atonement for our sins. If we could use Old Testament wording, then there would be no sin offering. When I think about this, my mind went to the story at the beginning of the Bible, Cain and Abel, and the different sacrifices that Cain and Abel brought before God. If you recall, Cain brought the fruit and the vegetable of the soil from his garden, the fruit and vegetable that he had actually grown. And Abel brought the firstborn of his flock. You see, with one sacrifice, that was acceptable. And the other wasn't acceptable. We won't go into the whole different reasons behind that. Suffice to say that Abel gave in the right way. In other words, it was a righteous sacrifice. Jesus was given for us. You see, if Pilate had listened to his wife, whose name actually were not told, and there would be different reasons for that, but if he had have listened to his wife and had nothing to do with this man called Jesus, then there would be no cure for sin. There would be no uh, atonement for sin. Christ wouldn't have taken our punishment. And that in itself is a terrible, terrible thought. We might not like that word, sin, but it's in the scriptures and we need to accept that we're all sinners and some of us are sinners saved by grace. But this in itself is a terrible thought because then there would be no morality. There would be no moral law. Righteousness is one of the great attributes of God. Micah, in the Old Testament, one of the minor prophets, Micah asked the question, What shall I bring to you, God? What shall I bring to you, God? And it's interesting the response from, uh, from God. Because it says, O oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. You know, God is saying that this morning. We may ask the same question, God, what, what, what shall I bring to you? What do you want from me? And 
here, here's a response. Just to do justice, to love, kindness, and to walk humbly before you go, your God. In Hebrew, it says this, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let me read that um, again in, for the book of Hebrews. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, of course, Christ's blood, then there is no forgiveness of sins. So we see also that the blood of the firstborn that Abel gave was for purification, as was Christ's blood on the cross that was shed. And without that, without Christ going to that cross, without the shedding of his blood, then there is no purification. But not only that, there would be no forgiveness, which again is a terrible, horrible thought. As I'm sure we all know that without forgiveness, then the only thing that happens is we breed or we can breed bitterness. Can you imagine a life harboring bitterness and anger towards someone? Not forgiving someone? That's a terrible thought. You know, because bitterness just grows and grows and grows. Anger grows and grows and grows. And eventually it can, um, eventually it can have a devastating effect on a life. Can you imagine a world without happiness and joy? It would be a pretty dark place. Also, we would be destined destined to have eternal death. I love the quote by the Italian psychologist Roberto Asagoli. Without forgiveness, life is governed by an endless cycle of resentment and retaliation. <coughs> Let me read that again. Without forgiveness, life is governed by an endless cycle of resentment and retaliation. You see, if there's no forgiveness, then it can be a pretty dark place. A life without the cross or if Pilate's wife got her way, then there would be no gospel. There would be no good news. The Easter story would just be a story. There would be no truth in it at all. Those who preach the gospel would be better finding something else to preach because there would be no point in preaching good news if there's no good news to preach. There are a whole lot of other areas that would be problematic and we've not got time to go into these this morning. There would be no grace, no mercy, no salvation. At the cross where Jesus died, all this was made possible. There's an old hymn um, and the title of the whole hymn is At the Cross. And it says there, Was it for crimes that I have done? He crawled upon that tree. Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. You know, it was at the cross where grace was established. It was at the cross where mercy 
was giving. It was at the cross where we see the greatest um, act of love that this world has ever seen. And it was Christ giving his life for us. Without the cross, there would be no Christianity. Without the cross, there would be no church. With, without the cross, Christianity would just be another movement. As someone said, it would just be a remembrance society or a remembrance story. There would be no point in having a communion service where we remember Christ's death, his blood shed for us, his body broken for us. The point is that if Pilate went with his wife's dream, Jesus wouldn't have been the Messiah. That's a terrible, terrible thought. And this morning, I thank God that Jesus died on the cross for you and he died for me so that we might have eternal life because without the cross, without the crucifixion, without Jesus' death, then it is a hopeless situation. Let's just come before God in prayer before we listen to our last hymn. Lord, it's a terrible thought to think that if your son hadn't died in that cross, what would have happened? Lord, we just thank you for the cross. Father, we just thank you that your son gave up everything to be on that cross, to die for our sins. Father, we thank you for grace, for mercy, for salvation, for that atoning sacrifice, Lord. And Father, as we go from this meeting, as we go from this um, virtual meeting, we pray that you would go with each and every one of us. And Father, just refresh that thought in our lives that Jesus came to die for me, that Jesus came to die for the people who are listening. What an amazing thought that is. And Lord, we think of that hymn, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus and Nazarene. And Lord, we do. We just stand in awe and wonder of the beauty of the cross. Amen. So let's just finish. Um, and it's good to have spent this time with you this morning, but let's just finish with our final hymn. The words you are about to experience are true. They will change your life if you let them. For they come from the very heart of God. He loves you, and He is the Father you have been looking for all your life. This is His love letter to you. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I'm familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being, for you are my 
I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope, because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore, and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you, for you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your father, and I love you even as I love my son Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me, and nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home, and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father, and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child?
survey the wondrous cross on which the prince of glory died my riches gain I count but loss and poor content on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingle down. Did I such love and sorrow me? All thorns compose. Yeah.